last session we stopped here with uh, swap swapping assignments between views and the idea was improve upon deep cluster deep cluster was an offline algorithm you needed to uh, push your entire data set through your neural network and then do your clustering and then those cluster assignments would give you the corresponding labels to update your neural network and the idea of us swap was whether you can borrow ideas from contrastive learning have two branches two different data augmentations on the same image or the same data or the same data point and then one branch is going to give the prototype assignments or labels for the other branch and vice versa and then you would write down your last function and then the question is how do you compute queues how do you compute your label assignments or uh, cluster assignments or prototype assignments you would do online clustering perhaps a couple of iterations of sync horn knob algorithm and then you let it train and this is going to give you one of the best performance after evaluating it after adding a linear layer on top of your features and then do train that linear layer and do classification using that before this paper we covered bootstrap your own latent bo and over there we had a similar framework you had an image you would transform it into two different views you take the views, get your representations, project it, and then have a prediction head, whose job is to predict its own latent. And then you also symmetrized that type of a loss function. The cool thing about this uh, framework was you didn't need to have negative examples. And you want to avoid negative examples because, first of all, uh, you need a lot of them. And then it means a lot of passes through your neural network, which is going to make it slow. And at the same time, even if you make it fast by caching those computations in memory, like what Moko was doing, you are trading of memory for computation. So it would be good to avoid having negative examples. And we said perhaps the success of BO is because of this prediction head, or it is because of this moving average. In the next paper, we are going to see that actually we can get rid of the moving average and we can solve the self-supervised problem or self-supervised learning problem even simpler. What is the idea? You have an image, you augment it into two different views. You're going to have the same encoder here, which is going to encode these two views. And then you're going to have a prediction head, which is going to predict the features from the other image or from the other view previously this encoder f was a moving average of the encoder on the left now all you need to do is put a stop gradient basically if you are using pytorch this is going to be dot detach where it's going to be tf dot stop gradient it's going to inherit the same advantages you don't need negative sample pairs uh, you don't need large batches because you don't need large number of negative examples anymore and then you don't need the momentum encoder this is an advantage over uh, bootstrap your own latent framework it is much simpler to code this so you have two views of the same image these are random augmentations you have a neural network it is usually a resnet in addition to the projection mlp so you still have uh, those few layers of mlp on top of your resnet we are going to have an additional prediction MLP head. If you take X1, push it through your uh, encoder, let's call that Z1, and then you can take Z1, push it through H, and then that's going to give you the prediction. P here stands for prediction. It doesn't stand for probability. You can do the same thing because you want things to be symmetric in the end. You want to write down a symmetric loss function with X2. Our last function is the negative cosine similarity. This is the one that needs to be minimized. And we saw this before, that this is equivalent to minimizing mean squared error of L2 normalized vectors. If you rename P1 divided by its norm to be P bar or P1 bar, and the other one be 
z2 bar you are computing the distance between the two square it and then sum it across your data or average it across your data so it's equivalent to minimizing the distance between the prediction and the latent and then you're going to symmetrize your loss this one is for p1 versus z2 you could have p2 versus z1 and the only advantage here is you are going to see twice the number of data points the advantage of symmetrizing without symmetrizing the method still works and uh, you need to let it train for longer to see as many examples at, as you're going to see here with a symmetric loss so that's the only advantage here but this is crucial symmetrizing is not crucial but stopping the gradient ends up being crucial without it you are going to pick the trivial solution immediately in the first few iterations you're going to converge to a constant solution where this neural network is just going to give you a constant function and it's not going to be a function of x1 and the features that you're going to get out of your encoder are going to end up being terrible they are not conveying any information about your input image so a stop gradient helps you get out of the trivial solutions so it turns out that stop gradient in addition to this predictor network are really important and you don't need to have a moving average of the model on the left an exponential moving average of its parameters the learning rate schedule doesn't really matter you can have a cosine learning schedule which is you have a warm-up stage and then you're going to follow the cosine function versus not even decaying your learning rate having it to be a constant number throughout your training process the prediction head is crucial without it you're gonna converge to a constant solution and this is basically the accuracy of random chance or flipping a 1000 uh, possibility coin this other one uh, it's not that important the other thing that is important is that your batch size doesn't really matter whether it be 64 128 or very large ones you still have the same or similar level of performance unlike what happens with contrastive learning that batch size matters the other one is batch normalization where should you do batch normalization without any batch normalization your accuracy is not that great if you do batch normalization on the hidden layer only so this is going to be your resnet on top of that you're going to get a hidden layer you do batch normalization there and then you do a handshake to the predictor and on top of predictor the last layer you can put a batch normalization again this is going to give you 67 per percent accuracy and the best one is where you have batch normalization here in the middle of your encoder right after residual connections end right after your cnn ends and on top of the mlp head and if you do it on all of them it's going to end up being unstable over here the thing that is unstable you have batch normalization in the middle of h and on top of it if you put batch normalization on top it's going to hurt okay and how do you compare to sinclair moco bio suave we covered all of them sinclair has a high mini batch size moco has a lower mini batch size but it has a lot of negative examples it was caching it it was creating a dictionary of negative examples to save computation bo for some reason they have a high batch size you don't need that here the batch size is 256 and then it's converging even after 100 epochs you don't need to wait for a very long time so after 100 epochs this is giving you the best performance okay any questions about sim cyan was everything clear okay awesome